is a professor at the Risolo University of Thessaloniki. He will be talking about the vapor barrier and its correct and incorrect use of the structural elements of building constructions. And he's going to talk about the structural element and buildings, how the vapor barrier might also cause a condensation of vapors if there is a layer with a high degree of resistance. Thank you, Chair. Allow me to kick off by thanking Ashre for they are inviting me yet again. So thank you for bringing me from Thessaloniki. It is a pleasure to be able to present you with uh, what we work on in our lab. Ladies and gentlemen, what I'm going to talk about is the vapor barrier. And there is a subtitle that explains exactly what I'm going to elaborate on. You see, the subtitle is, it's incorrect and it's correct to use of the structural elements of building construction. Sometimes we make mistakes when we assess the vapor barrier, and those mistakes might lead to uh, the destruction or damage to the structural elements of building constructions. Sometimes we fail to grasp it. We don't even notice those damages barrier is quite often misunderstood or put in the wrong way and it's quite often that we don't even realize that happens either. So allow me to kick off by saying this. Briefly, let me present you with some theoretical notions, notions that will help us understand this phenomenon and what sort of measures we need to resort to in such cases. First things first, uh, air has the capacity to attach itself to vapors. In any way, you will find uh, nitrogen and oxygen and dust particles. So the fact that you have vapor in the airs will depend on two parameters, temperature on the one hand and atmospheric pressure on the other. And since uh, atmospheric pressure in essence is thought of as undifferentiated regardless of the height of the building, we will just think that this is not this is not something that we need to take into account. But we are going to focus on temperature. Atmospheric air, air in the atmosphere will not be taken into account in this case because in essence you have more or less the same vapors on the ground floor and the top floor of any building. We are going to heavily focus on temperature, which is mostly taken into account for the vapor barrier. So in high temperatures, air will attach itself to more vapor and you will have less vapor in lower temperatures. I'm giving you this example on this particular slide. Let us just think of a room. Say this is the hall, the room that we are dealing with. We have a number of vapors here. We have gotten all the vapors together in this sort of globe, in this sphere. And so the capacity of air to attach itself to vapors, say, is 30 grams per cubic meter. The temperature, air temperature drop, then this capacity of the air will decrease, and so part of the vapors will still be held, but the rest will just fall off. And it will change from air into liquid, so you will have condensates on the surface of the structural elements. If we drop the temperature further, then the vapors will further decrease and eventually they will get to a minimum level, which is no, of no concern to us today because this is not the type of temperature we are, not going, we are going to insist on. So for us to understand each other, let's see what the equation is all about. There's a ratio. Should C be the quantity of vapor that at a random temperature will be there in the air? And should we say that C is the maximum quantity of vapors that can be there? C to CE, 
and we get percentage rates here, will give us, this ratio will give us, in essence, the percentage of vapors that are found in the air at that particular temperature. It's obviously less than 100, which means that there is also scope for more vapor, should there be more vapor, that is. When uh, eventually we have our one, the ratio equals one, then this would signify the saturation point. And if we are in excess of one, if we in increase our C, then we will have due condensates, that is, on the structural elements. So let us now deal with two theoretical areas that are separated by a structural element that is permeated by water or vapor. In the high concentrations, we will have a sort of trend. And there, through the barrier, you will should expect them to move where the concentration is lower, so that eventually those two concentrations will end up being the same. And those uh, empty dots that are left by the vapors that are migrating to the other side will be filled in by particles of air. But we have more gas to the right, air will move to the left. This is a vapor dissemination phenomenon or uh, diffusion, which is very important when it comes to structural elements will go will always depend on the temperature on both sides and the relative moisture. Should temperature on the one side be higher than the other and the relative uh, moisture be the same, I guess it's very easy for you to the vapor will go. If the temperature is the same on both sides, in the uh, temperature, it's easy to decide which way it will move, but there is always a problem when there are discrepancies between the two. Because in that case, we are not in a position to decide right away where the vapors will go to, the right, the right or the left. So this is where we need to take the pressure into account, vapor pressure, because vapor pressure depends what sort of pressure is exerted by the vapor goes through this element, that's what we care about. And in this particular case, the diffused vapor can be calculated. We don't really need to insist on the just that I'm showing you this slide because I'm trying to indicate that this is, after all, measurable. You see, vapor quantity is measurable, and it depends on a number of parameters, the most important of which being the following, the difference in pressure between the two areas, which I showed me before, first and foremost. And the main element in this calculation is, or rather, are certain premises. To remember that this is a unidimensional parameter that is not affected by other external elements and it's not impacting on the specificities and the special features of all the structural elements. But nothing of these actually is true, but we have to work on those premises and so we will. Suppose this is a structural element. There you have the inside area and this is the outside, the indoors and the outdoors. Due to the fall of the temperature through the successive layers of the element, you will find yourself two curves, the pressures, partial pressures curve and the saturation, vapor saturation. The dotted line shows us the maximum pressure that vapor can exert should the air in the pool of the structural element at any point in time be at a saturation point and it's the other way around when it comes to the other curve because the other curve shows us the pressure that vapors exert, the vapor which is at any given point in time in the pores of the structural element. Those two curves at first sight, the way you see them, never meet, so never converge. Should at a point, any point in time those two curves meet, then it will become apparent that the vapor is following a certain course and direction. That's the path. You have the pressure here, saturation pressure, and partial pressures. So just pay attention at this line, the shadowy part. 
try to interpret it, it's not impo it's not possible to interpret because it suggests that the pressure of the vapor, the maximum pressure that the vapor can exert when they've reached their saturation point, or rather when the air in the pores of the element has reached its saturation point, is partial pressure that the vapor is exerting partly on the element. This does not make sense. It's irrational. It can't actually happen. So what is truly happening there? In essence, from that point to this point, the real pressure that vapor exerts identifies itself or coincides with the saturation pressure, which means that the structural element has reached a saturation point. And what about the shadowy part? You might wonder whether well, this is the additional quantity of vapor that the element cannot hold on to, and this is the quantity that falls through or in the pores of the structural element in the form of condensate, so dew. So it used to be air, and now it's liquid. In other words, you have moisture or humidity, moisture in the structural element. And it's not obvious, it's not apparent, and it can't be seen because it's there in the mass of the structural element in a certain layer. So it's impossible for us to see it with our eyes. So we sort of grow complacent and have no idea what's going on, and we're not worried about whether this moisture will impact on the material. But you do realize that if that moisture impacts on the material, then the thermoinsular quantities of this material of this structural element will decrease. So that is why we are now reshaping, redetermining the curve. This used to be the shadowy part. This is the condensated part. Let's have a look at where this went. Rather, for us to find out what happened to this quantity, we are turning, well, on the x-axis, we're turning this into a new form. We're giving it a new form, and now we are not dealing with the thickness, but rather with the resistance on the x-axis. Resistance that each and every material, each and every structural layer uh, shows in the course of the vapor. We have mathematical equations to indicate those relations and ratios, and this, what get, you get to see now, shows you the diffused quantity of vapor from one layer to another when the difference of pressure on both sides of the structure element is specific through a number of uh, parameters, thus eventually determining the full or helping us calculate the full resistance that each layer shows. And after a mathematical processing of the data, we will come to the following conclusion. Should those two curves ever meet, and this is the thermoinsular material area or any other area which expands, takes up some room within the element. In the absence of thermoinsular material, we will have an area where the vapors will condensate or there will be a condensation level. I am through my slides, and I know that I'm going to show you some more images later on, but I'm trying to, to resume. This is normally the outside of the thermoinsular layer, which will be the part of the layer which will be more impacted and sort of absorbed part of we really calculate how much vapor will be condensated? Of course we can. We can still count the number of equations. At the flow of vapor from that point to the start of the condensation uh, is stable. It's the same as the equation on the top of your slide. And then forward, forward, it's steady yet again. It fails to be steady there at this exact point where we have the point of condensation. So if we subtract one from the other, we will end up with a quantity that will make sense of how much moisture we had in the structural element. This was all about the general theory. Let us now try to have a look at what really happens in practice and what sort of repercussions there are. Here we are faced with a structural element. The thermoinsulation is on the outside, then inside, and then on the inside, in the, in the midst. So let's have a look at how the two saturation pressure and partial pressure curve 
we might have all sorts of materials, polyurethane or uh, formaldehyde foam. And then we're going to see what happens to, say, glass wool, mineral wool, and so on. What is happening there? Whenever the thermoinsula layer is on the inside of the structural element, those two curves will easily meet. But there, where you have a fibrous thermoinsula, well, you have a more um, abrupt curve, which means that you will have a certain quantity of vapors there and moisture, they will condensate, but in this case, the quantity will be much higher. If the thermoinsulation material is introduced in the core of the, of the element, those curves will meet as you see, but if you have a thermoinsula material that is foamy and organic, in this case, the quantity of vapors that will form itself once those two will meet will be smaller. And if that material is fibrous, yet again that quantity will be smaller than before but still bigger than the previous one. But if we introduce the thermoinsulating material on the inside, then those two will never meet or rarely will they meet. And in that particular case, the uh, condensation will never happen. Never? Well, of course, never ever is impossible. There are some cases when there will be changes or discrepancies in the temperature and maybe there will be extreme temperatures between the inside and the outside and so in those cases you should expect some sort of vapor condensation at a certain point within the structural element but it's possible throughout the year if we gauge everything on the basis of a year, then this quantity of vapor will eventually throughout the year, throughout those, throughout those 12 months will evaporate and just uh, this thermoinsular material or layer will be sort of hurt and injured for very short time. Now, I have not taken into account yet another parameter. What is that parameter? The diffusion co coefficient resistance diffusion resistance coefficient and this shows you exactly what I suggested before you have a structural element no thermal insulation to the left then you have a drop in the temperature and this shadowy part shows me that when there is no thermal insulation a bigger area could possibly be uh, um, humidified. And then in the middle, you have the thermal insulation on the inside of the structural element. But yet again, this keeps the temperature quite high only in this part. And in the rest, the temperature is quite low. As a result, thereof, we still have condensation of vapor there. But if we put the thermal insulating material on the outside, the drop of the temperature will be mild in the, at the start. It will be abrupt in the thermal insulation. It should be like that. And then again, these, in this case, you just have for almost minimal thermal uh, uh, condensation. What really matters here is the resistance coefficient as suggested before. What is this coefficient all about? If we have a layer of air and this is sort of permeated by vapor, that layer will resist. By definition, the resistance coefficient will equal this layer of air is replaced by another structural material element, then the resistance to the vapor flow will be manifold, many times higher than that one that used to be there due to the air. So there you have a times something. So this will show what resistance any material will uh, show, will pose, and this is the coefficient resistance to vapor diffusion. This is important as the thermal conductivity coefficient whenever we are looking into any thermal insulation. And in order for us to know where that stands, um, in the concrete and the usual material, you get 5 or 10, 5 or 10 for 10 to 25, say in some sort of solid masonry, uh, then you have bore, gypsum boards or other gypsum boards, it's 10 
So you see the mass of those materials so hardly resist vapor and concrete has the higher such value on this slide. What about thermal insulation materials? Well, it's the same, more or less. We have glass wool, 1, 1.5. In essence, vapor that goes through glass wool meets no resistance and the same about expanded polystyrene and what about extruded polystyrene foam? It picks up as we go. The only one that has won a hundred approximately a hundred thousand is or foam glass as we call it. In essence all of the aforementioned materials show no resistance to vapors. Uh, they are almost not worth mentioning if we take into account now another series of materials such as marble and granite. They resist the 10,000 for them or an asphalt coating 40,000 or 50,000 or a bitumen layer same polyethylene sheets a 50 or 100,000 that's the coefficient for them for each and every one of those there are also an aluminum foil or sheet you will really find out that there is no for vapor to go through them and the same goes the same resistance is shown in the case of foam glass which I mentioned before let's have a look at a concrete example we have now two cross sections and the thermal insulation is on the inside and um, in the upper part we have a marble revetment and in the lower part of the slide we have some sort of cork a proofing material some cork, but it's suppose we have it now on the basis of the example gauge the practical consequences of things the vapors from the inside through the structural element and eventually sometime they will manage to go through the hot area this is the hot area to the cool area of the structural element fine so far so good but on the basis of what we said before there's a risk here risk of vapors condensating between the two areas because the two curves of the partial pressures and the saturation pressures could easily converge and meet so from that point to this point in the cool area theoretically speaking it is possible normal temperatures and relative moisture as prospects there are prospects there for condensation that's one thing and then again those vapors that will the outside not everything will but will condensate will get to this layer when they will get to this final layer they will not be so behind the marble revetment or the bitumen sheet in the air of those pores, they will reach their saturation point and thus condensate. Now, one might go, uh, one might say it's not a big thing. It's a big thing because when the reasons why the vapor it no longer are no longer there, then they will eventually start going backwards because from the liquid, uh, the, from being liquid, they will turn to air again. So there will be gases, but. If this structural element is receives daytime abruptly, then the liquid will turn into gas again. The volume of the liquid will increase by 1,500 times. And as you can realize, behind this bitumen sheet or this marble revetment now, we will have a very high pressure of vapor. And this high pressure of vapor could easily, very easily get this sheet unstuck. And if this does not unstick still, it might break and rupture. And when there will be rainfall, these ruptures and cracks will let rain go through. And now you have two types of moisture. You will have moisture due to the vapor condensation and then moisture coming from the rainfall because there were cracks and openings on the sheet or the layer that I used. surface is once again, once again receives the sunlight then again the quantity of vapor that will sort of want to evaporate will be high and so gradually the layer will destroy uh, will will deteriorate and um, this will always impact on in a manner the element what can we do to avoid that we can do 
And if we somehow manage to stand in the way of the vapor diffusion, if we keep the vapor from going outside, if we keep the vapor in, in the warm area of the structural element, then obviously the vapors will never condensate because the temperature in that point is still high. And so the air in the pores will be in a position to keep the vapors. All right, let's introduce that sort of material there. What sort of material is that? A material that will stand in the way of vapors going through an aluminum foil or a nylon foil, foil, plastic foil. Whatever we opt for using there will not hold, which means that I need to change the material I use on the outside. So let's forget about the mortar or whatever sort of mortar I'm using. In this case, we can use a, a cement board or a gypsum board or a mineral board or some sort of wood construction. But in any case, I will have to put uh, a bitumen foil, a bitumen sh- bituminous sheet on the back side thereof, or maybe a plastic foil or some sort of sheet metal. And so there you will keep your vapor. Beyond that point, the wall will receive uh, no more diffused vapors. There will be no condensation there because condensation would have uh, started in the area, in the space, the room. There's no difference between in, in the temperature between the two, so there will be no condensation. I'm afraid you only have five minutes left, right? So there's no condensation of vapor here. Let's go the other way around. Let's try the reverse. Suppose that you use thermal insulation on the outside. You still have the diffusion of vapor. It's there. There's no condensation up to that point. In that particular area, there is a slight tendency of vapors trying to concentrate, but they will never be able to permeate. Pot. So you want to keep it in a place where it will not um, impinge on your aesthetics. What about masonry and thermal insulation? Somewhere in between, you will place the vapor barrier. The vapors will get to that point onwards, and when temperature or the conditions on the inside change, the vapors will go back, which means that I should introduce a vapor barrier. When exactly should I do that? Whenever on the outside there is a non-permeable layer. We want, in essence, nonetheless, to keep everything or to leave everything free to breathe, as I'd say. We have to make sure we let all layers and structures. But can we keep everyone happy? Of course, a bituminous foil can actually be a touch on the outside. The same goes for the marble revêtement. What am I doing in this case? We are detaching the last outside layer from the previous element and I leave a gap, an aeration gap, ventilation. What is it this aeration gap does? In this case, there you have the diffusion of the vapor and if you uh, have holes on the upper part, on the uh, lower part of the masonry, then quite naturally those vapors will move to the outside freely. There's no risk of condensation and we have to take into account that in these cases, this gap, this void will be properly protected to make sure that there will be no rain falling in and uh, there will, moreover, no bugs or rounds or even birds going through that gap. So these two we need to make sure of. Because you see, if any sort of organism goes through that, be it bugs, insects, ants, or whatever, and this also applies to any form of material, then you will leave those with the best possible meals, meal forever. Because if you let any organisms go through that, past that, the thermal insulation in a few years' time will be gone. So make sure that you keep a very, that you put a very thick uh, netting to those uh, holes, to those openings, and so. The this uh, shell, this envelope will sort of anchor itself, attach itself and you have special hooks and this outside shell or envelope will receive or 
the negative repercussions of, say, the weather conditions, the wind, the rain. That is why there should be no continuum there. You have to allow scope in order for this to expand and shrink again. And of course, it has to be properly anchored as well. There you have the anchoring through strong metal features. There you have the metal grid and the anchors, and they are attached in a way so as to hold on to that envelope and keep it steady. This could be a mob river or porous stones or slabs, thin slabs, or a metal uh, layering. All of that, of course, doesn't allow vapor to go past it and then the envelope is not negatively impacted on by the weather conditions. Most importantly, nonetheless, all that is helpful in terms of dealing with that. But the most important thing in this case, of course, is to properly anchor Because you are just looking at the blueprint and you're not going to really see those metal elements on the outside. There you have it in essence, in practice. Here you have a construction. That's what we put on the outside, those slabs, and they are aerated. So there's airflow. The airflow is pretty normal. There's no vapor held in there. And this is how you make it. There are also other options and ways. You can have uh, ready-made panels, and those will be put at a distance of, say, 8 to 10 centimeters or even less. Or even they could be foils or use a, an infrastructure or a grid that is either metal or wooden. This is also feasible. Um, at a distance from the masonry or else there will be no aeration. Now there are waves created and it's easy for vapors to escape. I know, Chair, that you're worried. I see you checking your watch. I'm about to finish. Now this is contemporary. It looks as if this is a mobile revetment. It's not exactly like that. There is a gap right behind that and there's thermal insulation there. This gap, this void allows for the diffusion of or the migration of of vapors and so Instead of having something stand in the way of vapor, you have thermal insulation to protect yourself from anything on the outside, but you also have the vapors held in between. And this is even more modern. The concrete, uh, there you have thermal insulation. It's been slightly covered by mortar. There's still a distance between the two because, again, you have more Revet Mon. There's nothing obvious to the naked eye, and you shouldn't think that this is very modern. See, these are old houses, more than a century old. They are in uh, the in some islands outside Istanbul. Unfortunately, they are falling apart, but they count it on the same idea. This is wood, of course. This is a type of material that was available back then, and this allows for the vapors to circulate and flow thermal insulation. Now, these are two major mistakes we often make. This is the structural element. This is the masonry. This is the inside, and that is the outside. There you have the thermal insulation. You have the void, and there is proper aeration happening. So, there's a normal flow of air which carries out the vapors, and we often tend to believe, and this is a mistake, that uh, this is... Um, Uh, this will allow water to go past it, and uh, this is what sort of mistakes we often made, make. Quite often, we use caulking on the outside or say some sort of uh, tightening or water tightening element, and this will stand in the way of properly dealing with vapors. These will eventually lead to the deterioration of the thermal insulation. So in essence, we're doing nothing. It's useless. The same goes for, and this is yet another mistake, roofing quite often. We have thermal insulation on the structural element, and we're fearful of possibly getting water through the roof. And thus, we decide that we need to put some sort of foil there. If you do foil there, you do it in the month of February, and then you lift it, you will find out that there's not just condensated vapor there, but there is real water, which goes to show that the plastic foil will hold the water and so 
if the thermal insulation is impacted on by this water, then this will be destroyed as well. So let's forget about the plastic foil. If you want to protect the structural element from the rain or any other sort of water penetration, this is where you should have made this watertight. Now, if you happen not to be able to use some sort of caulking there or make this waterproof, well, if you're fearful that maybe there's no other option but to use the plastic foil, let me tell you this. If you introduce a plastic foil or any foil whatsoever, you have to use another plastic foil at the bottom of the thermal insulation. Then you will have a real barrier, vapor barrier, to stand in the way of your vapor circulating. On that note, let me thank you very much. I know I tied you, but thank you.